Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Deirdre Summers. I'm speaking to you here today in two capacities. Firstly, I'm president of the Federation of European Securities Exchanges, which represents 36 security exchanges in Europe of all asset types. Secondly, in my day job and the ones that pay me, um, I'm a chief executive of the Irish Stock Exchange, which has, like all smaller exchanges, a critical role in delivering uh, credible and supportive markets for what I believe is an extraordinarily entrepreneurial and ambitious corporate sector in Ireland. I have 20 years of experience in cash equity funds and fixed income markets, 13 of them. I'm kind of a weird chief executive of an exchange because I come from a primary markets background. <clears throat> and uh, during those 13 years in primary markets, I worked for a very large portion of that as the primary market regulator. That was in the good old days when stock exchanges were regulators. So in that time, I suspect, um, I read, I'm not harping back to the good old days, don't worry. Um, so in that time, I suspect I've read more prospectuses than many of the people in the room. Um, and I hope my comments um, aren't a little bit battle-worn and blunt uh, as a result. Um, I would say just a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with the chief executive of a bank in Ireland. And uh, it's one of our sweeter, kind of more, uh, more smaller banks. Uh, not one that was caught up in some of the problems you might have heard about. Um, but they came to the market first about 20 years ago and then decided to kind of go private and then they came back to the market um, about uh, nine months ago. Uh, their prospectus nine months ago was 560 pages long. Their prospectus when they came to the market um, about 15 years ago was 120 pages long. And that was for a bank. Um, which tends to always have a, a more complex set of, um, of disclosures. So that, in essence, and it was touched on, on earlier, is what we're talking about, because every one of those pages costs money. It isn't a cost-free um, piece of, of, um, of disclosure. So that ultimately has to be where we end up. How do we get some way back? How can we put that genie back into that bottle? So to start with, what I'd like to do is to sort of pull back. There's a lovely Irish expression, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And, um, and I think quite often with regulation and securities markets, you lose sight of the fundamental objective of regulations. And I'd like to pull back for a while and look at the problem and, and, uh, and the eternal optimist in me, and anyone who knows me will know that I'm eternal optimist, will say it's also the prize if we get this right. So how will we define success for you? Europe in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and it has to be about having a new generation of companies on our markets, be they formal or informal, of global scale, brand and importance, headquartered and managed in Europe, innovating and exporting from Europe, delivering globally the products and services that the world will want in 15 years' time, and delivering the opportunities for investment to European citizens to allow them to manage their individual wealth. So that's the prize. These companies have to come from the new and the old economies. We have to deliver public markets and solutions which allow for um, Europe's mid-market private and family-owned companies to deal with the intergenerational problems that is facing us. We need to ensure that new economy entrepreneurs see Europe as a credible home for them, and they don't at the moment, from which they can grow and scale and turn innovation into scaled enterprise and global brands. And the lubricant for all of this is funding. Without funding, you can have all the aspirations in the world, you can have lots of innovation, you can have tons of research, lots of small, clever companies, but no economic multiplier, which only comes from scale and growth. VC, private equity, private placement, banks, public markets, all have their individual and collective roles in providing solutions, and European regulation is crucial to ensure, is that going to be enabled, or more obviously, is that going to be prevented. So that's 
the start. Public, off, public markets, which I represent, are obviously crucial. Aside from the accepted fact that 90% of all jobs are created post-IPO, without credible public equity markets, Europe will never get, get the scale of company that I talked about earlier, those companies that will represent Europe on the world stage. But sadly, European public markets are not delivering. Of the 23 million European companies that we currently have, only 11,000 are on European markets. That's a miserable statistic. Europe is 75% dependent on bank financing for growth compared to the US at 25%. And this is at a time when everybody pretty much accepts that banks are, go are on a deleveraging cycle and therefore will never be, be back to that sort of funding capability that they had in the past. U.S. and Asian public markets, which experienced similar downward trends in the global cr financial crisis, have started an upward trajectory and improvement, and the flow of companies and capital is increasing fairly significantly. <laughs> Sadly, we are not seeing that in Europe, and the consequences of that are extremely stark. It is estimated there will be a €2 trillion Euro equity gap in Europe by 2020, and that equity gap will not be fixed by bank lending. So the diagnosis of the problem is complex and multi-layered, and you'd be very happy. I'm not going to go into that. Probably the best and most comprehensive analysis is one I've seen articulated in the IPO task force report produced under the leadership of my fellow panelist, Philippe de Backer, and I would encourage anyone to read it. Keep an eye on the prize, because ultimately you can lose sight. But a key, a key problem for any, for a, a key first problem is what is the cost of coming to markets? Prospectuses are the gatekeepers of product onto public markets. You can't come onto a market without a prospectus. And therefore, it is a key component of cost. The cost of that extra 350 pages is prohibitive for so many of the fledgling, idealistic, innovative and entrepreneurial companies that Europe is, is creating and failing to bring to the next level. Therefore, this review is absolutely crucial. If we don't get this right, all of the work that we have done through MIFID and MAD and all of those other um, more esoteric, shall we say, directives will be utterly irrelevant. We will have wonderful, unified, efficient, cheap equity markets with nobody on them. Overly dependent on a small number of mega companies looking down and an irrelevance to the vast majority of companies looking up. However, um, so in markets, be they organized like the markets run by exchangers or informal, there is always, though, a tension between how do you liberate access, but how do you protect on the other side, particularly retail investors who, in my experience, do need to be protected from themselves. And in doing this, there must at the very least never be a gap or a confusion between the investor expectation of protection and the reality of the protection afforded to them. And this is the balance. These are the balances that must be struck in this regulation. So what does this proposal deliver? From, from an exchange perspective, firstly and most crucially, we would say, yay, at least it puts an emphasis on equity capital. And I have to say I'm amazed to have to actually say this, but we have had so many years where there's been an ambivalence to equity in financial institutions and policy making, and it's incredibly refreshing to see it emerging now, and I hope that that will continue. Second, however, if done right, this regulation should reduce costs for entry into markets. We therefore fully support the streamlining of key requirements, the possibility to incorporate documents by reference, the alignment of shorter prospectus summaries with the format of the PRIPS kit, the fast track for e frequent issuers, increased flexibility for the base prospectus and their application to non-equity. However, the devil is in the detail. And as someone who has had the estimable joy of being on the first Caesar committee that brought the level two measures under the prospectus directive, under the first iteration of the prospectus directive, I have intimate knowledge of where that detail can go. When national consumer protections, national regulatory conservatism and paranoia, usually informed by the most recent national mis-selling case, come to the debate. 
Um, ESMA has an obligation to ensure that the spirit as well as the form of level one measures are followed and I will frankly remain very sceptical until I see those measures. And to be fair to ESMA, they have a huge burden of work to do with relatively limited resources. It is crucial that they are supported in that work by strong drafting and guidance at level one. Exchanges believe, however, that there are issues with the regulation which need some more consideration. But before I get to that, I have to say I was sitting in my chair there and I never thought I would say these words. I had one of those eureka moments when I heard Tillman's views on advertising. Because this was something you may not know that was fought for and failed abysmally on the first iteration of the prospectus because it actually doesn't matter how great the document is if you have all of those time, timing and administrative burdens with any kind of pan-European um, uh, sales opportunity, it just fall, all falls apart. So uh, it is wonderful that the Commission is thinking along those lines. But now let's get back to the considerations for the, for the directive. First, the director, we believe the directive should support the CMU agenda and does towards enabling the maximum broad range of public market funding options at local, regional, national, pan-national level. The optional, though, however, the optional domestic threshold regime up to 10 million will cause fragmentation at a localised level and in my opinion is confusing, which is even more damaging. There should be a single threshold above which European harmonisation applies, period. Anything else, less worried about the amount or the quantum of that, but anything else means that there is a, there is a potential gap between the investor's expectation of the, of the protection that they will be afforded and the actual protection that will be afforded in any jurisdiction, which in my experience always leads to problems. It would also seem somewhat perverse to me as a Europhile in a harmonising regulation to not only facilitate but to encourage disharmony. Second, the specific regime for SMEs is very welcome. However, defining an SME at a 200 million euro level is simply ignoring the, the reality of where markets have developed and the constraints within markets that are placed on companies of that size. Uh, the reality is, and I'm going to give you a shocking number, but Anything under a billion in market cap is an SME on European markets, and that would be a pretty global accepted um, figure within the markets world. We also believe that the proposed approach to this regime should be more clearly, more clearly articulated at level one to give relevant guidance to ESMA as it works through the detail. It's crucial, though, that this re risk re regime remains optional rather than mandatory. Third, we see no rationale for distinguishing between an SME that is on a regulated market and one that is not by excluding them from the regime. This results in all the wrong outcomes, completely polarising the most regulated part of the market, incentivising even those companies that have the ambition and the aspiration to go to a regulated market to choose not to. Fourth, while we welcome the extension of the exemption for secondary issuances from 10 to 20 percent, we wonder about the rationale for the figure. We're talking about the most regulated corporate issuer in Europe having to comply with a myriad of different continuing obligation regimes. To my mind, this percentage should be significantly higher. Fifth. <laughs> Anyone who has read 20 pages of risk factors will completely understand the problems that is in all prospectuses these days, and those have been articulated far better than I earlier. Risk factors have become a bit of a joke. Uh, they have nothing to do with investor protection and everything to do with corporate and advisory protection and, dare I say, legal fees. There has to be a responsibility on the company and its directors and advisors to disclose beyond a long list of relatively meaningless, material, immaterial, controllable, non-controllable risks that are unreadable and undigestible. However, we feel that the Commission's approach goes too far in the other direction, potentially imposing significant legal risk on companies and misinforming investors. We think that this is solvable with the right text and the right guidance to ESMA at level two. Sixth, 
We don't understand the proposal for the third country issuer to appoint a representative. We don't understand the purpose of it, other than providing nice fees for very little work. This type of provision makes the European markets look protectionist. It's totally unnecessary in our view, given the need for a very strong communication flow in any event between an issuer and the relevant competent authority. Last, and I speak here more in my capacity as CEO of the Irish Stock Exchange, the removal of the distinction between the wholesale and retail non-disclosure regime is particularly damaging. Non-equity is not bonds, and it certainly is not just corporate bonds. Sure, I'll be the first to accept that non-equity incorporates corporate bonds, which I would also accept should probably be more available to retail investors, Maybe. Um, but it also incorporates the term non equity, incorpor incorporates structured fixed income, derivatives, high yield, MTM programs, many other asset types that are fundamentally unsuitable for retail investment, have no interest in attracting retail investment, and whose issuers, if forced to comply with retail disclosure, will vote with their feet and structure and distribute around the problem, and that is outside of Europe. So if Europe does not want fixed income origination and distribution, this is a very good way to achieve it. Many commentators seem to have accepted this removal on the basis that they believe the disclosure regime, which is fixed at a, at a, at a wholesale regime, will remain roughly the same. Despite the securities now being accessible to retail investors, this is hopelessly naive. When ESMA comes to provide the detailed disclosure, the gravitational pull is and should be quite rightly towards more disclosure rather than less with the last retail scandal mis-selling first and foremost in every regulator's mind. This removal has been proposed also to allow retail investors access to non-equity investment. I'd argue, really? Is that what you really want? Retail investors going directly into complex financial instruments that are neither designed nor conceived for a non-sophisticated audience. The second argument put out, and it, it, it tends to be always the, because any person, when they mention liquidity, everybody gets more soft and mushy. But the second argument put out is that it will enhance liquidity in these instruments, allowing broader access is some gift to issuers in allowing for better transaction flow and liquidity in the marketplace. Anybody who understands the wholesale market and this sophisticated marketplace, which, as was said earlier, is clearly not broken, it works incredibly efficiently, doesn't understand the reality that 90% of the non-equity market is buy to hold, tailored for specific investment portfolios, specific risk profiles, and has no use, desire, or need for liquidity. I'm not saying the current definition is great, it's not, but none is not the answer, and I would therefore appeal to the Commission to reinstate a distinction, possibly carving out some small parts of the corporate bond market which may be suitable for direct retail investment. For the rest of it, leave it to the professionals in a market where time to market is fundamental for issuers and retail disclosure is just inappropriate. And I know that other commentators who know far more about this than I do, such as ICMA, have made proposals in this regard, and I, I would certainly support those proposals. In conclusion, then, I would say Europe does need a paradigm shift. It needs to have better, more inclusive markets, greater access to equity funding, increased funding choices, reduced burdens on issuers. It must deliver that enterprise scale and job creation and economic growth. Funding must be more accessible. And this is a really good first step. It will reduce bureaucracy, it will reduce costs, um, but that liberation must balance investor protection. Um, it has a few problems. We think they can be solved. As was said earlier, I think it's probably the first draft of a regulation from the Commission that is probably, dare I say, about 80% there, um, and will deliver a real solution to Europe and a substantive improvement in where we are now. So thank you very much.